All right, it is now the top of the hour. I want to thank everyone for joining us again for the CMV web series. Um, you'll see on the screen today's attendance URL and QR code. Again, if you open up the camera application on your phone and just focus it on that QR code, it should bring you right to the to attendance survey for today. If you don't want to do that, you can just use the URL at the bottom, and I will paste that URL into the chat shortly. Um, and then if you'll go to the next slide, please, just a reminder on um, how you need to ask questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please type them into the Q&A box, not the chat. This box will be monitored by committee members throughout the, today's discussion. And if we're able to answer them easily, just typing you an answer, we will. Everyone should be able to see those. And if it's something that we think is good for everyone to hear or that it's most appropriate for Ryan to answer, we'll ask them verbally at the end if there's time. And again, remember, um, our March 12th webinar is completely dedicated to questions. So if we don't get to your question today, we may answer it on that day. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ryan Collins. Ryan is a PhD candidate at Harvard Medical School and in the lab with Mike Tarkowski at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Broad Institute, where he's led the creation of the NOMAD SV database, which he will tell us about today. So thank you, Ryan. Go ahead. Thanks, Erin, and uh, thanks to uh, ClinGen for inviting me to come share the resource that we've built for structural variants as a part of NOMAD uh, that I'll be talking about a little bit today. So as, as Aaron mentioned, I'm in Mike Tarkowski's lab in Boston, but this, um, this work has been done collaboratively with, with a large group of people, uh, not only in Boston, but around the world, bringing all of the samples together to develop the genome aggregation database or NOMAD. So like I mentioned, uh, NOMAD is a large collection of exome and genome sequencing uh, data sets that covers at this point over 100,000 individuals uh, when you combine exome sequencing and genome sequencing. But for today's talk, we're going to be focusing on a subset of NOMAD that we've dubbed NOMAD SV for NOMAD structural variants. Uh, and this involves just whole genome sequencing uh, to an average of, you know, 30x coverage with Illumina short reads. So this is pretty standard whole genome sequencing technology, uh, but it is a part of the genome aggregation database, so that means that all of the data that I'll be talking about on today's webinar is available through the NOMAD website, which hopefully some of you are familiar with. Uh, the URL is on the screen here in the left-hand part of the slide, um, and it's integrated into the NOMAD browser and other resources, so I'll be uh, touching on some of those things throughout the talk, uh, but also Erin indicated that my slides, uh, she's kindly going to make them available for everyone. Um, so if you miss something, uh, don't, uh, don't worry, you'll be able to go back and look at it. And also I, I wanted to mention at the outset that um, we also have a preprint manuscript up on BioArchive that describes all this work. So if there's a detail I don't get to today, either feel free to email me or ask a question um, or just go and uh, check out our preprint uh, as there's a lot more detail, especially in the supplement of that paper. So in the current NOMAD SV release, uh, which is a catalog of structural variants from genome sequencing, like I mentioned, uh, we include uh, 14,891 samples, a majority of which are non-European. So you can see the breakdown in this bar plot on the left compared to other SV resources like the Thousand Genomes Project or Genome of the Netherlands or the GTEx Project. Um, there's a breakdown of samples on the right at various stages through filtering and removing related individuals, but I do want to note that there were a subset of samples for which we didn't get appropriate consent to release uh, genetic frequency, site frequency data through the browser directly. So when you go to the NOMAD website in the NOMAD browser, uh, that is representing 10,847 unrelated individuals. Uh, so it's a subset of, of the samples we mentioned in the paper, but still uh, over, you know, 10,000 samples of whole genome sequencing. A common question that we get about NOMAD and, and particularly relevant for this webinar is what phenotypes are and are not present uh, in NOMAD. So for those who are unfamiliar with NOMAD in general, um, it is a large scale aggregation effort to bring together as many human genomes and exomes as possible. And this is generally done across uh, population genetics and common and complex disease association studies that have been sequenced through various uh, consortia and funding 
bodies. Uh, so by that reason, there's no sort of predominant phenotype that is or is not present in Nomad in general. However, there are some biases, um, both phenotypes that are enriched in Nomad, but phenotypes that are, are more importantly deleted. So we do have, or sorry, depleted. So we do have some exclusion criteria. Um, so specifically any sample with a known pediatric or early onset disease or any first relative of any individual with a known dominant or Mendelian uh, disease is excluded outright from NOMAD. So uh, this reference then, as you can see on the histogram on the right, we think is uh, a very approximately representative of the general adult population. So the average age of a sample in NOMAD is 51 years old in, in NOMAD SV, I should say specifically. Um, However, given that we're, we've aggregated data um, through the NOMAD consortium across many common and complex disease studies, there are some particular diseases that are enriched in NOMAD. And so uh, the, the one that in NOMAD SV is most prevalent is uh, cardiovascular diseases like myocardial infarction and uh, coronary artery disease in particular. There are also some non-trivial uh, numbers of adult onset neuropsychiatric disorders. So again, depleted for early onset or pediatric disorders. And uh, as the data set grows in scale, this will, uh, these biases will continue to dissipate. But right now, these are really the only two phenotypes that have uh, known uh, enrichment in NOMAD, particularly the cardiovascular disease. But to that end, uh, to allow you to use this data set uh, to analyze cases with those particular phenotypes, we do provide subsets of the cohort that I'll talk about in a second, how to access those. And these are uh, labeled the non-neuro subset. So this is a subset of samples with all neurological diseases excluded and also controls only. So these are individuals that are uh, specifically labeled as control subjects from their contributing studies. Uh, to further refine the data set. And there's a URL at the bottom of this page to look up which projects have or have not contributed um, in, in case you're specific about a, a certain cohort or, or study and whether it's represented in NOMAD, you can view a full, full list there, but there's over 90 different sequencing projects that have contributed. So it's quite a diverse data set. I'm not gonna spend too much time on uh, discussing the science or the methods behind the construction of the NOMAD structural variant data set today in the interest of spending more time talking about how you can use the data set and some uh, recommendations. But just for one slide on methods, to generate structural variant calls across these 15,000 uh, whole genome sequences, we developed and have developed over uh, uh, many, many years in the past uh, half decade, uh, a pipeline that is uh, deployed in the cloud that we're calling GATK-SV, uh, which to summarize a few of the key features, it maximizes sensitivity for structural variants by running multiple different algorithms. So you can see the four that we ran in Nomad uh, listed in the top right part of this schematic. We then re-adjudicate every variant against the raw sequence level read features. Um, such as anomalous paired end reads or split reads or changes in read depth or, or uh, normalized coverage. And then we use machine learning to essentially boost specificity. So we try and target a balance of sensitivity and specificity. And then of course comes the latter half of this entire process, which is genotyping variant resolution and annotation. So uh, through this whole pipeline, it's designed for large cohorts. What is produced is a jointly processed genotyped uh, and we hope fairly uniform uh, data set of every structural variant discovered in any sample genotyped across all samples. So just to give a one slide snapshot on what the NOMAD, current NOMAD SV data set looks like, uh, in total it includes 433,000 different structural variants across seven different uh, classes of structural variants. So red and blue are copy number variants. So that's going to be the two colors that are most relevant for, for this webinar. But just to mention in passing that there are many other classes of structural variants represented in NOMAD. But across the board, most structural variants we capture in NOMAD are small and rare. Uh, and then in the top right portion of this slide, I'm showing that the, uh, as is perhaps you know, expected, the frequency or, or um, rarer variants tended to be larger in NOMAD in general, consistent with these variants being more deleterious. So larger CNVs are held at lower frequencies. And then if you just take an average of the number of structural variants captured in NOMAD per sample across different populations, you'll see that 
uh, this is relatively stable, but that we're around, say, seven and a half thousand structural variants uh, per genome on average with this method that we're using, GATKSV. There are no gold standard benchmarking methods for structural variants, of course. So instead, we used a battery of different approaches, uh, seven shown here, and we've done several others since, uh, to get at sort of the quality assessment, which I think is an important point to touch on for uh, how you can use Nomad SV as a reference for interpreting uh, CNVs. And so uh, I'm not going to get into the technical details of each of these different comparisons, but I did want to highlight just two to give a sense of some of the analyses that we've done. So first, given that in the data set, we, in the Nomad SV data set, we had 970 complete parent-child trios, uh, we were able to assess calls made in the child based on their, whether or not they appeared as inherited and uh, transmitted from either parent. And so from this, we can come up with a 3.8% Mendelian violation rate which likely represents a mix of uh, false positives in the child as well as false negatives in the parents. We also can use long read pack bio whole genome sequencing uh, available on a small subset of samples in NOMAD to directly uh, re uh, reassess the calls we're making in NOMAD from short read Illumina sequencing. And so we were able to do this on close to 20,000 different structural variants and uh, come out with a, around a 94% positive predictive value of the calls made in Nomad SV based on whether or not they're able to be confirmed by the long read whole genome sequencing data. And there's some, as I mentioned, there are other approaches we've taken, but they all generally landed on that our data set is, is fairly specific um, and sensitivity is sort of harder to assess depending on the different technologies. But we estimate maybe around a four to 6% false discovery rate in Nomad SV. Just one more point on the quality of the data. So uh, a common question we get about NOMAD is how accurate the structural variant breakpoints are. And so to assess this, what we've done is we've taken the long read pack bio sequencing that I mentioned on the last slide and uh, directly asked the question, given our prediction from the short read data in NOMAD, how close does that coordinate come to uh, the breakpoint coordinate as reported by long read assemblies, which should be much more accurate. And accurate within plus or minus uh, 10 base pairs, and uh, over half are accurate within a single base pair. So in general, we think the breakpoint precision is uh, pretty good in Nomad, although maybe a quarter of all variants are, are off by more than 10 base pairs. Next, to compare to the uh, existing largest published cross-population reference from the Thousand Genomes Project for structural variants, we find that NOMAD captures over half of all the structural variants in the Thousand Genomes Project, and that among variants that were captured in both the Thousand Genomes and NOMAD, the allele frequencies were very highly correlated, but given that now we have the advantages of much deeper sequencing, so over 30x average coverage, like I mentioned, as well as we have sevenfold more samples than were included in the Thousand Genomes Project, we cap, uh, the Thousand Genomes only contains 14% of the structural variants we now catalog in NOMAD. Uh, so you can appreciate the difference in, in scale there. So there's 86% of all variants in NOMAD are not uh, represented in the Thousand Genomes Phase Three release. Next, uh, one of the main features of the NOMAD SV data set is for every structural variant, we've considered uh, many different possible genic consequences, similar to how you would annotate uh, short variants or sequence variants like SNVs and indels. And so there's a matrix of the four most common gene consequences we've annotated here, broken down by uh, each row is a different structural variant class, but for the purposes of this webinar, the top two are deletion and duplication. And so for deletions, uh, we annotate them as loss of function against a gene or LOF if it overlaps with any canonical protein coding exon of a gene. And so this is a very simple annotation, but we think it captures a majority of the real loss of function cases. For duplications, of course, they're more complicated to interpret. And so we do annotate some duplications as loss of function if they uh, meet the criteria listed on the leftmost column. But we also annotate Inter, uh, intragenic exonic duplications, which are annotated as IEDs. Uh, if one or more exons within a gene are duplicated, uh, but the boundaries or the breakpoints of that duplication don't extend beyond the edges of that uh, gene's uh, 
body. And then, of course, we also annotate whole gene copy gains if an entire gene is duplicated. So these are the main consequences that we're considering for uh, copy number variants for the purposes of this webinar today. And I should also mention that this figure and many more details are available uh, in the preprint that I mentioned for Nomad SV, but also in our supplement. We go into extensive detail about this if you're curious about the technical specifics. Using this annotated structural variant data set in Nomad, uh, I wanted to highlight a few of the benchmarks that may be more relevant to uh, clinical and medically oriented audience like is on this uh, webinar today. And so just three points that I want to highlight that we've benchmarked in NOMAD is uh, to assess the ability of this short read genome sequencing drive data set to recapitulate some well-known genomic disorders that appear at low frequency but appreciable frequency in the population. Uh, we've compared the frequency of CNV carriers uh, in NOMAD for 49 reported genomic disorder loci to those same frequencies estimated from the UK Biobank and find that the carrier frequencies, even though they're different samples from different populations, the uh, carrier frequencies are extremely highly correlated, suggesting that by and large, and there are some exceptions that I'm going to talk about later, but by and large, uh, these large CNVs in the genome are being well captured in NOMAD SV and represented at, at accurate allele frequencies, at least based on what we know from microarray data. Another data point worth mentioning is that we find maybe about one in 200 individuals in Nomad SV carries a very rare uh, loss of function structural variant in a dominant haploinsufficient disease gene. And so this rate varies based on what uh, gene list you consider, for instance, but, um, and I think this is actually an older version of the ClinGen haploinsufficient gene list, but the rough estimate is you know, the, and the, the reason I bring this up is that it's not um, unsurprising to find high quality, real predicted loss of function structural variants in dominant disease genes. It's just they should be at a, a much lower frequency than, than in your disease of interest, for instance. But they are out there and they are cataloged in our data set. And then finally, um, we find close to 4% of samples carry a rare uh, structural variant greater than a megabase in size, and about half of these come from deletions and duplications. Uh, and I should note that 99.3% of all of the samples sequenced in Nomad SV are derived from whole blood DNA, so we really don't think that cell line artifacts are, are going to be a, a major issue here. And so we, we think this is a fairly accurate estimate of the rate of large, rare uh, co copy number variants in the general population. So I'm going to transition now to talking a little bit more about some of the um, practical hands-on use cases and some limitations and recommendations for using Nomad SV to interpret copy number variants. Uh, so I do want to start by mentioning just a few limitations, and these are some of the bigger limitations. Uh, first off, we know that we have a reduced sensitivity for small duplications and insertions. And by small, I mean, let's say less than a few hundred bases. Uh, this is an area that uh, we've worked pretty hard over the last year to improve methods. And we actually have uh, a new version of GATKSV that isn't yet publicly released that um, it does better in this regard. And the next version of Nomad will have a much improved sensitivity for small duplications. But the current Nomad SV release uh, um, specifically, if you're trying to interpret small duplications or insertions on the order of a few hundred bases and you don't see that call in Nomad SV, uh, that is not to say that it has not yet been, uh, it's not in the samples we've sequenced. We may just have reduced sensitivity to catalog that variant. Another limitation, uh, and this was pointed out by uh, a member uh, of this webinar, Allison Bright, actually. Um, is that there appear to be rare cases where large copy number variants can sometimes be fragmented. So this is uh, the case for a duplication I'm highlighting here. Those two blue bars represent uh, two different duplication calls that are uh, genotyped as uh, non-reference in the same, exact same 20 individuals. And so if you look at this locus and it's flanked by, non uh, uh, by segmental duplications, uh, and it's known to undergo non-allelic homologous recombination, uh, we are almost certain that this call sh these two calls should actually have been merged. And so just something to keep in mind when you're using this data set is if you see uh, two calls that span the um, you know, entirety of your copy number variant of interest, it may be the case that uh, those those two calls were actually uh, erroneously fragmented, although uh, based on a manual review we've done, this is a, an exceedingly rare edge case, and I have some data uh, in the next slide to, to demonstrate that. But they do exist in the data set, and we're working on fixing that for a future release. And then finally, 
just given the availability of the samples that we were able to include in Nomad, we do have some uh, relatively limited coverage of Asian, Latino, and, and uh, oceanic populations. And so just another thing to keep in mind if your sample of interest is coming from a background that isn't well represented in, in our current data set, we're working hard on improving that for a future release too. So like I mentioned regarding the fragmentation issue, one way that we have gone back to reassess um, how the contiguity of our copy number variant calls are is looking at the same set of uh, 49 previously reported uh, genomic disorder loci. And so th these are kind of hard to see, and this is from the supplement of, of the Nomad preprint if you want to go and look in more detail and, and perhaps zoom in on a few of these. But what I'm showing is essentially the estimated change in copy number for either deletion carriers in red or duplication carriers in blue. And while it, the specifics vary depending on which loci, as you look at, um, you can see that the change in copy number is abundantly clear for almost all of our predicted carriers at almost all of these uh, genomic disorder loci. And so I think that I sh I'm showing these data just to drive home the point that the case where copy number variant calls are being fragmented in Nomad does happen, certainly, but uh, it, it seems to be pretty rare from everything we've been able to see. But if you do find something, just, just good to keep in mind. Okay, so now for some specifics, just a uh, very basic 101 on how to access, browse, and use the Nomad SV data set. So first, you need to go to the Nomad website, which is nomad.broadinstitute.org. That'll bring you to uh, a screen that looks like a uh, little screenshot one on this slide. You can then search for your gene or locus of interest using the search function. So for instance, if we're looking at BRCA1, uh, it'll bring you to a page that looks like uh, the screenshot two. And then you need to, the most important part is you need to activate the structural variant data set by going up to the top right of the screen and clicking on the Nomad SVs. Uh, button and this toggle will activate the SV data set and deactivate the SNVs and so uh, it'll switch you over to a, a browser view that looks almost identical but you're looking at structural variants not uh, sequence variants like SNVs and indels and this is very important because a lot of people get tripped up on that and perhaps maybe we need to make it clearer but it's in the top right part of the screen. So then if you scroll down from, I think this is a, a different gene, this is uh, the gene Llama 1, I think I just grabbed as an example, but if you scroll down from the top header of the Nomad webpage, what you'll be presented with for a given locus or gene is uh, a, um, a browser level view. We call this essentially the browser view, this is a gene view, but um, this is showing all of the structural variants that we've cataloged from whole genome sequencing uh, in coordinate space from left to right in genomic coordinate space relative to the reference genome. Uh, and there's a few different options on how you can configure this. So I wanna just point out a couple. The first is in the top right part of this screen, you can choose two coloring modes. So you can color by consequence, which is the default, which will highlight predicted loss of function or copy gain variants, or you can highlight by a structural variant class by clicking on that toggle button, which I find more intuitive, you know, where um, all deletions here, for instance, are demonstrated in red, all duplications are, are colored in blue, and uh, non-CNVs are the other colors that you're seeing there, so like insertions and complex variants and things like that. Um, but one thing to be able to tell what mode you're browsing the data in is the uh, filters, so in where I have that box that indicates filter options in the middle of the slide, uh, the filters that are colored represents the color scheme that's actually applied to the data set as you're browsing it now. So you can see that the different classes are colored uh, in this current screenshot, which indicates that that is how the variants are being colored in the table in the uh, browser above. And then finally, all of the variants uh, are also represented as a table in the bottom most part of the screen. Uh, and this table is uh, downloadable. There's a button at the top, or sort of on the left-hand side of the screen, where you can export this to a CSV format, which you can then uh, move into Excel, or however you like to work with just tabular uh, structured data. And uh, this table is also sortable. So to sort any of these fields, you can click on the uh, column header, or the column name, which is a nice way to browse and, and uh, access different components of the data pretty quickly. 
And then finally, one thing to mention is anytime you see a little question mark, uh, a white question mark in a, a black circle, that will bring up a, a help pop-up text, which can be useful if you're unfamiliar with some terminology or abbreviations. We've tried to document extensively uh, the different abbreviations and, and definitions that we're using. So keep an eye out for those because they can be kind of useful. When you click on a given variant, either in the going back, so uh, either on the variant ID, uh, in the variant ID column of the table, or if you click directly on a variant as displayed in the coordinate space view above, it'll bring you to a view that looks something like this. So this is just one example duplication uh, that I clicked on. And this is a screenshot from what you'll be presented with if you click on that duplication. Uh, and it has a few different aspects that allow you to uh, a assess the quality of the variant which um, we can talk more about in, in a slide or two but also uh, understand a little bit better the frequency and distribution of this variant in the population and so at the top left part of this screen you have a suite of, of various uh, variant metadata so this includes basic things like where it is in the genome its quality score its size its SV class but it also has uh, indications for uh, what evidence we have for this variant. So here you can see that this is a duplication that has significant read depth evidence and normalized B allele frequency evidence from the SNVs uh, within this duplication. So this is a pretty high confidence variant. It's assigned quality score 999, which is the highest uh, that we assign to any variant. It's the maximum. So this is a very high quality duplication. Going down uh, the page on the left-hand column, you can see that we provide consequences. So uh, in this area of the page, every predicted genic consequence for a canonical protein coding transcript will be annotated here. Uh, and this is where the, the pop-up, the help pop-ups are particularly useful if you are unfamiliar with what we're annotating as, for example, a copy gain event. You can click on that and it will describe in detail um, what, what falls in that category. Uh, and so here you can see that this duplication is predicted to result in copy gain of the gene OR2T3, which is an olfactory receptor, I think. Uh, and then the most important part of this page is at the bottom left-hand corner, you see the different population frequencies. And so this lists the uh, global superpopulations that we've annotated in the current NOMAD SV data set. Um, these populations are going to be dramatically expanded in the future release that we're actively working on right now. But for now, this is the lowest level of, of granularity that, that we can provide in terms of population frequencies. But the one thing that we've added recently, uh, thanks to user feedback, and I think this is a pretty useful feature, is if you click on the little triangle next to each uh, population label, so that little triangle next to African, for instance, it gives you a breakdown by male and female. So this is useful for variants on X and Y if you're curious about uh, uh, hemizygous males versus homozygous females, for instance. And then on the right, you can see a distribution of genotype quality metrics. There's a link out to the UCSC genome browser. You can report an issue with a variant by clicking on the links in the top right. And there's also an age distribution that you can filter to just carriers of this variant to see if uh, there are any particularly old and particularly young individuals in our data set. Um, but in general, it will look something like this as representative of the, of the data set as a whole. Uh, if you're more inclined to working with this uh, data set from the command line or in something like R, or if you want to uh, use it as a database um, for web applications, we encourage you to download this data. And so we provide it in a, a few different formats. So if you go to the NOMAD website, so nomad.broadinstitute.org slash downloads, it'll take you to the downloads page. This is also accessible and a link uh, at the sort of header uh, bar of the website, but you can click on structural variants under the summary and that will bring you to this blowout uh, uh, section that I've highlighted in red dashed lines on the right hand side of this slide where we provide both uh, VCF or variant call format files as well as bed files depending on which format you prefer uh, to work with the data in. And then we also provide these files as uh, downloads for the controls only subset, as well as the non neuro subset I mentioned in one of the earlier slides today. Uh, and then in terms of filtering, uh, this is a, another common question is what filtering do we recommend? And so I think as a general rule of thumb, 
um, you typically should not need to apply any post hoc filters uh, to the Nomad data set. We've really worked very hard to get the specificity of this data set to a point where uh, the average variant in Nomad can be trusted. Of course, there will, there will be exceptions. And so keep an eye on the qual, the qual scores, which stands for quality score, um, because we find that they're fairly well calibrated, as I'm showing on this slide, across a number of different metrics. Lower quality scores typically have lower rates of supporting evidence, either from uh, de novo rates based on trio analyses or pack bio long read sequencing confirmation rates or even just uh, linkage disequilibrium with uh, nearby SMVs and indels. So across the board, lower quality scores do tend to be lower in those uh, validation methods. But in general, the majority of our data set um, should not need to be filtered. But another thing to keep in mind is short read genome sequencing also uh, struggles uh, in repetitive and low complexity sequence contexts, And so if you're interested in a gene, say in a segmental duplication, um, that may be an area where you want to tread with more caution. But for the 92% of the genome that is relatively non-repetitive um, and uniquely alignable, this should not be a, a major issue. But just uh, one point that I, I do want to emphasize is I wouldn't encourage anyone to rely only on Nomad SV. So for instance, also checking DGV uh, or also checking uh, the Thousand Genomes Project because there are variants that either never existed in the samples that we've sequenced in Nomad or we've missed in Nomad that uh, you'll capture by spreading a wide net. And so I encourage you to annotate frequency against uh, you know, several population data sets and not just relying only on Nomad. Uh, some other FAQs, and then just I'll spend the last few minutes talking about constraint scores, as this is uh, another uh, common question. So for FAQs, uh, is there an HD38 version of Nomad? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the answer to is there a version of Nomad that is native to HD38? The answer is no, but uh, Tim Heffron's team at uh, NCBI's DBVAR has very kindly uh, set up and is maintaining an HD38 leftover version. So you can go to the NCBI DBVAR website and look for our accession number uh, to bring up the HD38 leftover version. Um, can you access individual level genetic data uh, for Nomad? Unfortunately not. Uh, this is just a consequence of the um, very restrictive uh, consent that we had to obtain to aggregate samples across this scale. Uh, it's, it's a necessity for producing this resource that we don't release any individual level genetic information, only aggregate level information. Similarly, phenotype data, it's in the same bucket. Um, often we won't have detailed phenotype information because we're aggregating samples from uh, large common and complex disease association studies. So these are not uh, by and large clinical or clinically referred samples um, or just general population samples. So in general, phenotype data is not available. Um, is is GHK-SV the, the method publicly available? Uh, yes, there is a Git repo, but it currently is only the architecture it supports is restricted to Google Cloud. Um, but a team at the Broad, the data sciences platform, uh, is going to be releasing a fully documented and production quality version of this pipeline very soon. Um, so we anticipate probably quarter two of 2020. And then uh, constra constraint scores for SVs specifically. Um, this is a common question that comes up. We've done some pa statistical power analyses and we are nowhere near powered enough to get to the level of computing per gene constraint scores uh, for how well uh, an individual gene tolerates deletion or duplication. Um, but we are very interested in that are, and are going to do that as soon as we have appropriate power to do so. So that's actually a perfect segue into the last couple of slides that I want to talk about today before turning it over uh, to Aaron and then answering some questions. Um, and that is specifically constraint and how it relates to structural variants. So um, I'm sure many of you on this uh, webinar are familiar with the concept of mutational constraint, but uh, as it pertains to NOMAD, it's essentially a score that can be computed uh, or a, st a metric that can be computed for an individual gene that will say how tolerant that gene is of damaging or functional variation in the general population. So uh, the classic example of, of how this was originally computed was for loss of function, uh, single nucleotide variants, uh, and genes that are constrained do not tolerate 
loss of function SNVs in the general population. And so uh, we think of these as, you know, you can think of them as haploinsufficient genes. Uh, historically, P this has been uh, presented through a metric known as the PL a PLI score, the probability of loss of function intolerance. Uh, some important distinctions about this metric, it's a it is a probability, but it's a probability of a binary sort of yes or no classification of whether or not this gene is constrained against loss of function. So using the PLI score as a quantitative metric of how constrained a gene is, is not a good idea. And we actually do not recommend that you do that um, from the NOMAD data set. Uh, conversely, Conrad uh, Karshevsky in the recent NOMAD set of preprints has introduced a new metric called uh, the observed over expected ratio or abbreviated as LUF. Uh, L-O-E-U-F, which is the, statistically speaking, it's the upper bound of the 90% confidence interval for the ratio of observed loss of functions in the data set versus the number of expected loss of functions. And so while this does not on its own indicate whether or not a gene is constrained, that's what PLI does, it does now measure the, the strength of constraint on a gene. So using the observed over expected ratio is a much better way to say how constrained is my gene of interest, for instance. Uh, and so in general, we recommend that you use uh, observed over expected ratios. And then finally, uh, I just want to close uh, my portion of the webinar today by making the case that uh, based on the integrating the NOMAD structural variants and NOMAD short uh, sequence variants, we find that constrained genes typically don't tolerate deletions or duplications. And so uh, what I'm showing in these three panels are three different types of, um, or three different consequences for copy number variants on genes. So on the left, you have loss of function. On the middle, you have whole gene duplication. And on the right, you have those internal exon duplications that I mentioned earlier. And what we're essentially doing here is we're correlating the relative depletion or enrichment of rare functional copy number variants in genes based on how constrained they are against uh, loss of function SNVs. And so you can see that the really strong linear correspondence here suggests that genes that are um, constrained against loss of function from point mutations are also constrained against both deletions and duplications. And we actually have a lot more uh, data and analysis on this end, but in the interest, interest of time, I'm going to uh, stop there by pointing you to the uh, Nomad preprint and also feel free to email me if you have more questions about this. But the main takeaway from this is that uh, you should, in general, on average, be able to use constraint scores derived from SNVs in Nomad to help interpret uh, how well a given gene will tolerate a deletion or a duplication in your patient sample. Um, although, of course, there's many more considerations to take into account. And so I'll stop there and by thanking everyone um, involved in this work and thanking you for your attention. And then also, uh, just to point out, my contact information is in the bottom part of this slide. Feel free to email me uh, if you have specific questions, or I'm also happy to answer more questions at the end of the webinar today. But with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Aaron. I think, um, so do you want me to stop sharing yep, screen? if you will stop sharing, I will start sharing. All right. Okay. And for anyone watching this on video later, I know that that results in a brief black screen, but now you should be back. Do you guys see my screen? Or Ryan, can you just confirm you see it? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. Slideshow. Okay, so now we'll switch gears and look at an example CMV with population data. So this is a paternally inherited deletion at 4Q13.2 in a three-month-old male with early onset epileptic encephalopathy. So for any of you that may not be familiar with that particular phenotype, know that this is a very severe early onset condition, exactly the type of condition that Ryan was mentioning that we, we think that NOMAD SV should be depleted for. Um, in terms of family history, this variant was inherited from the child's 40-year-old father who has no known personal or reported family history of seizures of any type or of any other neurodevelopmental disorders. Since this is a deletion, we will be using the loss scoring metric. So as we usually do, we'll walk through each section of the metric. And of course, the first thing that we do is an initial assessment of genomic content. We can see here that this deletion does include at least one protein coding gene. So we'll apply category 1A, which is of course worth zero points, but continue our evaluation. 
Um, this deletion does not overlap any established, as in curated by ClinGen dosage sensitivity, haploinsufficient or benign genes or genomic regions. And it also does not include any genes meeting criteria for category 2H, the haploinsufficiency predictor category. Uh, the CMV only includes one protein coding gene, so we will apply category 3A, which is also worth zero points, and continue our evaluation. So, since our CMV only includes a single protein coding gene, this is the obvious place to start for section four, the detailed evaluation of genomic content. When we look at this particular gene in OMIM, we see that it's been associated with a bone mineral density phenotype, which is enclosed in braces. And as you may know, the symbols preceding condition names in OMIM do have specific meaning, and the braces here indicate contribution to susceptibility for multifactorial disorders. And our current CMV evaluation framework is most appropriate for evaluations involving Mendelian conditions and multifactorial conditions such as osteoporosis, as example here, are not really typically something we focus on when doing clinical variant classifications in affected individuals. As we continue to review the OMIM entry for this gene, we learn that it belongs to a family of enzymes that catalyze the transfer of glucuronic acid from uridine diphosphoglucuronic acid to a variety of substrates, including steroid horm hormones like testosterone and estradiol. And a quick literature review indicates that deletions involving this gene appear to be relatively common and have been studied in relationship to a variety of different things including bone mineral density, which is the basis of that omen morbid link that we saw before, um, testosterone and estradiol metabolism, and pharmacogenomics. So how common is it? So let's search for this region in Nomad SB. Um, in order to simplify this screenshot, of I'm showing only variants with the predicted consequence of loss of function. And you can see that there's a large deletion similar in size to our deletion that has been observed in almost 8,000 alleles for an allele frequency of 36%. If you click on this variant, you'll find some additional information, which Ryan just told you about. Um, the variant has passed Nomad SB's quality control specifications. It also is observed in all the listed populations, both in the heterozygous and homozygous state, in individuals of a, a wide range of ages throughout adulthood. So a quick check of this um, region also in the database of genomic variants, or DGV, which we will hear about next week, shows numerous similar size deletions across various studies. Um, so with a frequency this high and this much supporting data, it's appropriate to apply category 4.0 at the full minus one point. So in summary, for this particular CMV, it can be classified as a benign, as benign. Again, with a population frequency this high, including many homozygotes, it's highly unlikely to be the cause of our patient's severe early onset phenotype. It's also unlikely to result really in any demonstrable Mendelian phenotype. Additional testing is warranted in this case to determine the genetic etiology of the early onset epileptic encephalopathy in this patient. You could technically also assign additional negative points in category five for the variant uh, because the variant is inherited from an unaffected father, but that's not really necessary in this case. But what if our observed variant was actually larger and it included this region that we just talked about plus additional genomic material? So now let's consider a case that I'll call Y2. The same patient, the same reason for referral, also paternally inherited, but this is much bigger. So here I'm showing you a visual representation of the size difference between our previous case, which is the smaller red bo uh, bar towards the right of the screen, to our current case, which is the larger red bar spanning the entire browser screenshot. You can see the buildup of population variants that we just looked at in the DGV gold variant track uh, towards the right. Throughout the rest of CMVY2, however, you, you do still see some DGV variants, but the deletions are all relatively small. Also note that many more genes are now involved in, in the CMV, and that is what is shown in the red box at the bottom. So let's look again in Nomad SV, this time in this um, expanded coordinate range. The arrow in the red box are indicated the, indicating the very frequent variant we were looking at earlier. Notice how it's now a much smaller proportion of our observed variant. There are other predicted loss of function variants in the region, but again, they're much smaller. It appears that much of CMVY2 does not significantly overlap with population variations. 
So the bottom line here and what I'm trying to show you with this kind of extended example is that just because the CMV overlaps the frequently observed population variant, you can't automatically rule out the impact of the rest of the deleted region. You need to look at your CMV in its entirety. In this particular case, it would be appropriate to investigate the potential impact of losing any of the other genes in the region. And just a very quick search in Decipher indicates that there's at least one other omen morbid gene in the region, and there's one gene that meets the haploid sufficiency predictor criteria. So taking a closer look into those genes and potentially the others as well would be appropriate here. And at this point, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. I'm going to leave the attendance code up for a few minutes in case anybody didn't get that at the beginning. And bear with me while I try to pull up the questions without stop sharing the screen. Okay, here we go. So, Ryan, if you will take yourself off mute, I think the first few questions are related to you. Um, so, one is in regard um, to the, the, the population in NOMAD. Are cancer patients excluded as well? Uh, yeah, so we in NOMAD SV have no uh, cohorts specifically derived from uh, cancer data sets. So, there should be, uh, of course, there will be individuals that went on to develop cancer, but there were no entire cohorts such as uh, TCGA, for instance, or PCOG, the large cancer sequencing. Uh, consortia. So um, that was an issue for, um, or a consideration for XAC and NOMAD for the exomes where TCGA data was included, but not for NOMAD SV. There's no cancer patients. All right, next question. Um, do you confirm any of the variants by MLPA? MLPA, no. So we have not performed MLPA validation, but we have uh, performed direct comparisons on over 2,000 samples uh, with standard microarray-based CMB calls, uh, and we find over 99% sensitivity to recapitulate uh, microarray-based CMB calls in Nomad SV on those 2,000 samples. Um, additionally, we performed Sanger sequence, PCR and Sanger sequencing and uh, DDPCR based validation on a subset of a few hundred uh, predicted de novo structural variants. And there we find over 99%, or excuse me, a 97% uh, confirmation rate from molecular validation. So we haven't done any MLPA specifically, but uh, we've taken similar approaches and molecular validation to uh, confirm you know, over 95% of, of the variants. All right, and the next question has to do with that slide that you showed about the, the consequences that figure with the, the deletions and the duplications. So if you want to show that again, let me know. Um, but for the annotated gene consequences figure, for dupes to be considered loss of function, do both breakpoints have to be within an exon or just need to be anywhere within the gene? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, currently our annotation scheme uh, requires both breakpoints of the duplication to land in exons. And the reason for this is that we also consider uh, intergenic exonic duplications, like I mentioned, where we're not as sure of the functional consequences there, but if the breakpoints are within, um, both breakpoints are within uh, exonic sequence, then you would expect it to result in a frame shift eight out of every nine times. And so there, we're more confident in, in considering it loss of function. So uh, to the question, yes, both breakpoints must land within exons to be considered loss of function for duplications. All right, how were variants with varying breakpoints in the cohort condensed into unique variant calls in Nomad SV? Yeah, that's, that's another really good question. That's obviously a, a challenge for calling structural variants at scale. We've done quite a bit of work on this and, and have a, a, a fairly simple, actually, approach that works well. Well, it's a single linkage clustering approach uh, where we do it hierarchically um, across different batches of samples before expanding to the whole cohort. And we also wait to collapse variants um, across all samples in the data set until after the uh, re-adjudication and, and machine learning I mentioned in our methods to boost the specificity. So by the time we get to collapsing variant calls uh, into individual genetic variants, um, the specificity of the data set should be uh, 
many fold, you know, several orders of magnitude improved over what a raw SV calling algorithm would produce. And so um, at that point, it's much easier to cluster down to real genetic variants. And so we're using a, um, the criteria we use for collapsing to variants does depend on the variant size and variant class. So for instance, for copy number variants derived from read depth based analyses that are particularly large, uh, there we're requiring a reciprocal overlap between two calls of 50% or sorry, excuse me, 80%. And then as the call gets smaller, so say below, I think it's 10 kilobases, we require 50% overlap. And then for anything, any call that was derived from a uh, paired and or split read based uh, sort of read alignment level caller, um, there we're using uh, breakpoint level clustering. And I think we allow uh, it's either 300 or 450 base pairs of distance between both breakpoints of a, a, a pair of CNVs in order to be clustered. And so um, based on molecular validations where we've Sanger sequenced the breakpoints, we find that this approach works uh, surprisingly well for the vast majority of cases where it's gonna run into problems and where, where this question is, is uh, offering a good opportunity to provide some extra context is in repetitive sequences, so segmental duplications or low copy repeats or simple repeats where uh, there could potentially be many, many different biological variants with different breakpoints that all fall within the same region and there the methods that we're using don't perform as well. So just a word of caution if you're in, uh, you know, evaluating a variant in a segmental duplication or something like that, uh, that's where the breakpoint uh, clustering approaches I've mentioned will uh, be confounded. All right, and could you comment on um, blood-only mosaicism or AIDS-related hemopoietic clonality being an issue if you use only blood samples? Yeah, that's, a, that's another good question. That is something that we've looked at. So um, we have processed several thousand uh, cell line derived samples uh, and now, you know, over 140,000 uh, blood derived samples. And I can say pretty unequivocally that um, cell line derived samples or non-blood uh, samples have uh, many fold higher incidence of these large uh, cell line artifact copy number variants. And so we think that blood, um, based on all the evidence that we've seen, blood is going to have a much, much lower uh, rate of these types of artifactual large CNVs that might arise in culture. But it is a good point that uh, clonal uh, clonality and um, different hematopoietic lineages might, um, you know, produce these somatic variants that, that could be very real, but also very large. And in fact, we actually do see that um, in NOMAD. So uh, extended data figure one of the NOMAD SV preprint has, I wish I had a slide on it. I, I didn't prepare one for this talk, but if you go to the preprint and look at extended data figure one, you can see some examples where we see uh, individuals with 70, 80, or 90 megabase uh, apparent mosaic deletions or duplications, and presumably these are uh, somatic variants that arose in blood. So the incidence of that uh, is very low. Like we, um, well, so A, we filter out most individuals that we can detect one or more such large, uh, you know, massive, say greater than 10 megabase somatic variant uh, from the call set just to protect against that because if you have if they have one such variant then we can't be confident that they don't have others that were you know missing or classifying as germline or, or similar um, but we do know that they do exist uh, in the cohort that we processed and we've done our best to prune them from the data set and we find that the incidence of uh, sort of blood-based somatic mosaicism is is much lower than in our experience many cell line derived uh, sequencing data sets so we think it the nomad data set that you access uh, you know, through the browser right now today, say, should be mostly depleted of, of such variants. But it's, it's a possibility that, they're, that some are still in there. All right, and our next couple of questions um, are about constraints. So can you comment um, PLI and LUF? You know, do you recommend people use one or the other? I know that you've got some parameters that you recommend for each. Would you want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. So I, that's that's um, an important point. I'm glad it came up in the questions because I, I breezed over it a little quickly. So I think it depends on the question that you want to ask. If you are trying to ask whether or not in Nomad your gene of interest is significant, statistically significantly depleted 
of loss of function variance, then PLI is the right tool because based on the probability, and typically we recommend a cutoff of say 0.9, but you know that is, is a arbitrary assessment. You could do 0.95 or 0.99, but the higher that the PLI score is, the more statistical confidence we have to say whether or not a gene appears haploid sufficient. Um, but what unfortunately happens a lot of times, and I think you know the NOMAD team has been working hard on improving our communications around this, is uh, PLI is not a quantitative metric in that a gene with a PLI of 0.7 uh, is not the same thing as being 70% constrained. Uh, that is saying that we are uncertain about whether or not this gene uh, is constrained or not from a statistical standpoint, uh, and so we would not classify it either as uh, constrained nor unconstrained. And so it's in that sort of ambiguous gray area. And so I think that's where a lot of people get confused with PLI, is a PLI score of 0.5 is we have no idea whether it is constrained or not. And usually that's due to the gene being too small or the variance being too sparse. Um, there's a number of other technical reasons for that. And so that's where uh, LUF and the observed over expected uh, ratio I mentioned really uh, has a much um, much more utility. So it can give you a score ranging from you know zero all the way up to one for most genes, where um, that is the fraction of observed loss of function variance compared to what we would expect under our mutation rate model, which is pretty well calibrated. And so um, there, a score of 0.5 says we see only half as many loss of function variance um, as we would expect. A score of 0.2 is we only see 20%, and a score close to zero suggests basically we don't see loss of function variance in this gene, even though we expect to see some. And so LOF is really powerful for telling you roughly how you know uh, constrained a gene is or how damaging it, it might be to uh, disrupt this gene. Um, whereas if you're just trying to get a simple yes or no, is this does this gene uh, is this gene depleted for loss of function variance or not? PLI might be a better tool. So I think you can use both, but it really depends on what you're trying to, uh, what statement you're trying to make about uh, your gene of interest. All right, this next question I believe is about your regional constraint metric. So it's written as for intergenic deletions when we're trying to figure out evidence of pathogenicity is is it possible to use nomad to find the frequency of loss of function variants in the involved exons in the general population if you want to show anything let me know yeah cool so i um i think i won't need to show anything for this i i did have a i guess a clarifying question though which is is this in talking about intronic deletions or intergenic deletions uh rodrigo if, if you want to type in any um clarification to that unfortunately Ryan everyone's on mute yeah I guess I can, I can answer both and and uh, hopefully this this captures the question so for uh, intronic deletions um, oh intra exonic okay so I'm interpreting that to be uh, a, a deletion between two exons so in an intron so there actually we can um, we have looked at deletions that arise in between two exons and that correlates uh, very strongly uh, with uh, loss of function constraint of the gene um, that the deletion is in, even if it doesn't disrupt coding sequence. So uh, intronic and non-coding variants in general, of course, are much harder to interpret, but um, as a rule of thumb, uh, we do see correlations with the coding constraint or the loss of function constraint of a nearby gene uh, and its, uh, loss of, its nearest uh, non-coding structural variant or deletion. So you can use the, the constraint scores, I guess, to answer the question for both intronic and uh, intergenic events, but um, you know, there's going to be some more, more uh, complications. It's not nearly as straightforward to predict uh, the functional consequence. And if you're particularly interested in that, we do have a whole section in the Nomad preprint on that to read more about that, or I'm happy to answer more questions about it offline. But uh, short answer, yes, you can use constraint, but with some caveats. All right, and final question. Um, do you have any plans to include Nomad SV as a track in the UCSC Genome Browser? Uh, we would love that. We have uh, been talking with the UCSC Genome Browser team, or at least we've started communications um, to make that happen. I have no timeline, but that is definitely on the list of things that, that 
we would like to see happen, but it's it's sort of out of our hands. You know, it's if UCSC wants to support that track and and working out some of those details. But I think um, I don't see any reason why not, and that's something that we're we're working on now, or at least thinking about. Um, so yeah, hope to hope to be able to do that soon. All right, well, we are near the end of the hour. I know there were a few questions that we did not get to. So Ryan, I will send them to you if you'd like to um, answer them. And what I'll do is I'll add them to the FAQ section of our CMV web series website. And I'll put a link to it in next week's reminder email. Um, so apologies to anyone we didn't get to today. And then next week we will hear from Jeff McDonald who will talk to us about the database of genomic variants or DGB. So thank you everyone. Thanks.